After a fun-filled day of driving across the Salad, we headed back to our hotel in the town of Iuni, where we met up with yet more motorcycle riders. And then we headed back towards the city of Potosi, across the Altiplano, which in Bolivia is populated primarily by llamas and vicuñas. Vicuñas are the wild ancestors of llamas from which they were domesticated. They're slender and graceful with much shorter hair, and almost always a uniform brown color that matches the grass of the Altiplano. Once we arrived back in Potosi, we drove up and over the flanks of Cerro Rico, giving us a great view of the mines. And the appearance of the mountain is quite remarkable, pockmarked with hundreds of holes like some kind of giant anthill. It's kind of amazing that the entire mountain hasn't collapsed in on itself. As we headed south down out of the Altiplano, the landscape started to look increasingly familiar to me, populated by acacia trees and giant columnar cactus, resembling the Sonoran Desert of my home. We spent a very pleasant last night in Bolivia, camped out in the farm fields of Don René, outside of the little town of Santiago de Cotagaita. And then the next day we made fast tracks towards the Argentinian border. It's 11.46 and we're about to start our crossing into Argentina! So upon arrival at the Argentinian border, I found out that I need two things in order to cross that I can't get at the border. I need to get insurance for the motorcycle, and I need to pay a fine, essentially, that Americans have to pay because it's so expensive for Argentinians to apply for an American visa. Weighing in at a whopping nine hours, Argentina takes the lead in the longest border crossing of the trip. Yep, the worst one. They sent us to buy insurance in town, but there's nowhere in town that sells insurance, so or we have to go. Internet. Oh, yeah, you can't buy it on the internet either. So we have to go to some other city and buy insurance, I guess. Yeah, good times. It was pretty late by the time we crossed the border into Argentina, but fortunately for us there was a campground right on the other side. And that's one of the great things about Argentina. Unlike Bolivia or Peru, there's tons of campgrounds everywhere, and they're usually pretty cheap, too. We spent a few hours driving through striking high-altitude landscapes, and then by the middle of the day, we somehow arrived back in Arizona. I still find it hard to believe, even though I've driven through it, that two places so geographically isolated can look so similar. And as the day drew to a close, we finally crossed the other tropic. I've been in the tropics since about the second week of my trip. And if you've been paying attention, you'll have noticed the absolutely staggering array of environments that we've traveled through. So for those of you who are wishing for a tropical vacation, be careful what you wish for, because you could end up somewhere looking like southern Arizona, or freezing your butt off in the Bolivian Altiplano. And speaking of freezing butts off, that's what we did the next day. As we drove south, we encountered a wall of freezing fog. And even though we were going down in elevation, the temperature was getting colder, a phenomenon that I found to be both counterintuitive and absolutely unfair, as we had gotten dressed that day expecting a rise in temperature as we went down in elevation. Eventually we made our way through the cold to the little city of San Salvador de Jujuy, where we were finally able to buy the insurance that we needed. And from there we headed south through increasingly green scenery and increasingly smaller roads. At one point, the highway we were on turned into something that looked like a glorified bike path. And at first I was like, what is this, a road for ants? But then I got to really like it, as it proved to be perfect for the motorcycle. And there was almost no traffic. We spent much of the rest of the day lazily winding our way through an absolutely incredible green forest. And if you're planning at all to drive a motorcycle through Argentina, I would highly recommend this route. I can't remember the name right now, but I'll put a link in the description. And at the end of our windy road, we ended up in the city of Salta, where we spent the night in a noisy but pleasant campground, where we met this Greek couple who were riding around the world on a Vespa. They said it's a great way to travel, even though sometimes one of them has to get off and push. I'll put a link in the description to their blog for those who are interested. Once we crossed the border into Argentina, we noticed immediately that the cities were a lot prettier and there wasn't trash everywhere. And the city of Salta is a great example of this. Standing in the plaza, it feels like you could be somewhere in Spain or Italy. Also, fortunately for Gabby, it's a lot easier to find things like birdwatching field guide books here, which made her happy to no end. But despite its appearance, Argentina does have one fairly large drawback. Outside of the major cities, the entire country shuts down between 12.30 and 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you need to do anything important, like exchange money or buy food or the mandatory motorcycle insurance that you have to have to drive around in this country, you'd better do it in the morning, because in the afternoon, you just can't. 
As we headed south from Salta, the scenery started to dry out again, and after many miles of driving through what looked like an incredibly thorny forest, we found ourselves in a canyon, populated primarily by goats and giant frog-shaped rocks. Here again, the scenery struck me as strongly resembling the southwest of the United States. And even though it's comforting to be in a familiar landscape when one is so far from home, the little differences are also fascinating. Like this caracara we found chowing down on a dead bird on the side of the road. Caracaras are something like a cross between vultures and hawks. We don't really have that many of them in North America, but here they're all over the place. We see a ton of them, probably because they like to hang out on the side of the road and eat dead things that bounce off of vehicles. Also hanging out on the side of the road, we found this burrowing owl. Burrowing owls, as you can probably guess, live underground. They don't dig, they just occupy abandoned burrows of other animals, but they can rotate their head 270 degrees, so that's pretty cool. A few herds of sheep later, the highway we were on turned to gravel, but compared to the other unpaved highways we encountered in Bolivia and Peru, it was an absolute dream to drive on. Even the river crossings, of which there were more than I expected, this being a desert and all, were fairly easy to deal with. At the end of the day, we drove up and over one last little patch of Altiplano, and then down into our next destination, Belén. We arrived in the picturesque little town of Belén, and almost immediately we were gifted our first flat tire of the trip by a giant thorn from a persopus tree. Fortunately, we were just a block away from a tire shop, so we were able to get it repaired quickly and easily. The first couple nights in Belén, we shared a habitation with a seriously hardcore couple from Basque Country, also traveling on two wheels, but completely under their own power. Each of their bikes was loaded down with somewhere near 80 pounds of gear which combined far exceeds what we have on the motorcycle, also for two people. We spent our first few days in Belain stacking up a few small pyramids worth of adobes, and then we headed out 30 kilometers into the desert to help our host repair fences on a piece of land where they were planning to plant walnut trees. On the drive out, the road was pretty bad but still manageable, but while we were working, a tractor passed and graded the road, filling all of the ruts and crevices with soil finer than baking flour, which did not help even in the least bit to improve the conditions of the road, and actually made it much more difficult for us to stay rubber side down. And so, since this is apparently a place for first, we had our first fall of the trip. And somehow, miraculously, I managed to record it. We emerged relatively unharmed, but incredibly dirty thanks to the several inches of extremely fine silt that we fell into. We stayed for a couple more days and helped shuck our host's incredibly colorful corn harvest, and then we headed back to Belain via the scenic route, which, like any good scenic route in South America, included llamas. So in this part of Argentina, there's actually two kinds of large columnar cactus that grow here. There's the Echinopsis atacamensis, which is the same one that grows on the islands of the Salar de Uyuni. And there's also Echinopsis teixequii. And the way you can tell the difference between the two is the Atacamensis has very fine hair-like spines, and the teixequii has giant robust spines that say clearly, do not mess with me. Hola. <laughs> donde comercializamos los ponchos que, que hacemos eh, y vendemos en todo el país, a los pueblos, eh, acá en Belén, en Belén, Catamarca, ¿no? Argentina. Si puedo poner el sitio de web en vídeo. That's all for now. Thanks everyone for all your support and encouragement. As usual, if you have any questions or comments, please let me know, and we'll see you all next time.